Would it surprise you if I told you that you've never heard of one of the biggest car companies in the world? I'm talking about Geely. Now the badge might be only 30 years old, but in that time, they managed to sell millions of cars, win an FIA Manufacturers Cup, and set a lap record at the Nürburgring. But how in the world did they go from making janky cars in the 90s to buying Volvo? And what made their founder so mad that he drove a steamroller over an entire lot of cars. Hold on to your sweaty bums, because we're about to find out. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Geely. Chapter 1, The Legend of Lee. It all started back in 1963 in a small Chinese village called Zhaij. Uh, I'm going to say a lot of words wrong here. I'm going to do my best, but uh, a lot of these are going to be pronounced wrong. It all started back in 1963 in a small Chinese village called Zhaijang, where a young boy was born by the name of Li Shufu. Li was an ambitious kid and often said outrageous things to make people laugh. Kind of like me. I can relate. Lee would ride his bike around town, you know, normal kid stuff, take portraits of people and sell them for money. Normal. <laughs> it was a viable first business for a young entrepreneur. And after that, he took up recycling precious metals, which proved to be more successful than photography. And by 1986, Lee was doing what most of us were doing in our early 20s, selling our hugely successful metal recycling business to start a refrigerator company. This man knows how to make a mo' money, baby. But by the end of the 80s, Lee was bored with the refrigerator business and donated it to the local government, you know, like you do. Sure, he was making money, but he wanted something new, something less competitive. He wanted a market he could really scale up. I'm talking about the car market. Uh, car manufacturing is one of the most competitive markets out there. Uh, yeah, maybe in the US or Europe, but in the 90s in China, the market was just starting up. A few foreign badges have been able to sell cars in China, but there were no privately owned car companies. The Chinese government owned all of them at this point. They sold models that were designed and manufactured in China, but they also sold rebadged foreign cars, which were considered exotics. And by exotics, I mean like second gen Passats, which sold in China for 29 years. That's longer than Nolan's whole life. Needless to say, many people thought Lee was riding the cuckoo train to Crazy Berg. He even went to a manufacturer who provided parts for Shanghai Volkswagen and was hoping to sign a contract, but when the man in charge heard Lee's plan, the dude literally left the room without saying a word. He ghosted him in person. That's cold, man. That's ice cold. Now, despite the overwhelming odds against him, he remained undeterred and felt confident in his ability to design a car. Lee said, cars are just two couches on four wheels. How hard can it be? That is a literal quote from the dude. I want to put that on a shirt. Cars are just two couches with four wheels. Have truer words ever been spoken? I don't know. But since cars were proving difficult, Lee went to the next best thing. He bought an old motorcycle factory that was on the brink of bankruptcy and started producing his own motorcycles, making it the first privately owned motorcycle company ever in China's whole history. And China has a lot of history. I think there's a restaurant in China that was established in the year four. I'm not making that up. The year four. He named the company Geely, which roughly translates to propitious, which roughly translates to indicating a good chance of success. It's uh, propitious. Now, the Avengers Endgame here was not to keep making motorcycles, but to produce the opposite of a motorcycle. I'm talking about a luxury sedan. There's a problem though. No one at the factory knew how to make one. So Lee bought a Mercedes E280 and started taking it apart. He studied and reassembled it piece by piece to fully understand the precision of its engineering. Then he bought a different car, a Hong Ki, to provide the chassis and engine for his prototype, creatively named Geely number one. Uh, this car, how do you say, um, was not very good. It looked bad, drove bad, broke down a bunch, and Lee quickly realized that building a luxury car for his first car might not have been uh, the least ambitious idea. So, 
Lee turned his focus to making cars that everyday Chinese citizens could afford. I mean, just simply owning a car was seen as a luxury in China at the time. And even the cheapest cars on the market, I'm talking Suzuki Altos, Daihatsu Shirads, were upwards of $13,000. That's 24K in today's money. Lee wanted to make these hatchbacks better, but more importantly, he wanted to sell them for cheaper. So, like the Mercedes E280, he bought a few Shirads and took them apart piece by piece and began to make them his own. Chapter 2 a crushing defeat. On August 8th, 1998, the very first production Geely model rolled off the line, the Hao Ching, which translates to ambition. Featuring a 1.8 liter Toyota four banger, the same engine as the Sherrod, it only made 83 teenage hearse purrs, but for such a small hatch, it was pretty, 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 pretty good. Unfortunately though, <laughs> pretty good didn't matter because no one bought them okay they looked exactly like Daihatsu Shirads except the build quality was worse the interior was full of hard plastic the paint was terrible and there were huge gaps in the panels which let water into the cab Lee had a huge premiere party and only one person showed up he got so mad that he took a steamroller and drove over all 100 cars that he's made. That is a true story. That is some Enzo Ferrari type stuff. Down and out, but not down for the count. Lee did what all of us would do. The dude started making buses under the name Boeing. That's until the Boeing called him and was like, uh, hey man, you can't do that. So he quickly went back to the name Geely. And while going back, Lee returned to the drawing board, determined to make his dream, the Hao Ching, finally a success. Debuting in 1999, the much improved new Hao Ching started selling. They were infinitely more reliable than the first generation and provided a cheap means of transportation to people who in the past couldn't afford a cheap means of transportation. Geely started turning a profit and before long, they bought a second factory and started producing a new model, the Mi'i Ri, which translates to it's a beautiful day. I don't like you too. If you like you too, you are allowed to like them, but I don't. Up until this point, Geely had been operating in a gray area of Chinese law. Okay, they weren't fully allowed to produce cars as a private company, but everything changed in 2001, six years after Post Malone was born, when China joined the World Trade Organization. Geely was now a fully privately owned company. But during this time, Geely got to work on building the first self-developed sports car in Chinese automotive history. It was called the Mei Ring Bao, which translates to auspicious beauty level. It had a 1.5 liter Toyota motor and a five speed manual gearbox, which seems like it could be a decent car, but again, it didn't matter. Toyota, who had been supplying Geely, decided to double the retail price of their engines, making it financially impossible to continue with the develop of their sports car. So left with no other choice, Geely began developing an engine of their own. Something similar to the four cylinder design of the Toyota FE. These little Geely Econo boxes sold like freaking hotcakes. And over the next decade, Geely became a ubiquitous brand. They were selling 140,000 cars a year. And in 2009, Ford announced that they were selling the Volvo brand to Geely for $1.5 billion with a B. This was huge news. A company that 10 years before couldn't even sell one car was now buying one of the most recognizable car brands in the world? Yeah, it seems like a bunch of luck, but what if I told you Lee had planned this all out from the very start? Chapter three, Sweden the deal. $1.5 billion hairs for a legacy car company, Volvo. And in true Lee fashion, he let Volvo remain pretty much independent and allowed them to continue designing and producing their own cars with minimal oversight. Sure, it would have been more cost efficient to produce Volvos in China, but Lee kept the factories in Sweden and Belgium open, appeasing the homies at Volvo and all of their unions. In 2010, the deal was finalized and Geely started using Volvo technology to make their own cars much, much better. 
Not only were they able to upgrade the existing Geely Econo boxes, but Lee was finally able to achieve his lifelong goal of developing luxury cars. And it couldn't have come at a better time. Chinese citizens were becoming wealthier. They wanted an affordable luxury car that could give them, as the kids say, clout. In 2015, Geely debuted the Bao Ru E. This large family sedan was a canceled Volvo concept that found a new life with Geely. It features different trim levels and engine options, including a 1.8 liter turbo, a 3.5 liter V6, and a hybrid engine capable of 261 hearse purse. I know, that's not sports car territory, but as we've learned time and time again, it didn't matter because Geely was about to launch an all new brand dedicated entirely to sports cars. Chapter four, a link to the future. In 2016, Geely launched Link & Co. using the CMA platform designed by Volvo. They developed the front-wheel drive 03, named after the year that I graduated from high school. This feisty little compact comes with a few powertrain and transmission options, including a two-liter turbo four-cylinder that makes 190 hertz. But the hot version, the 03 Plus, comes with a 254 horsepower, turbocharged inline four, made it to a seven speed dual clutch with them freaking paddle shifty boys. Geely wanted to prove their sports car brand on a global scale. So they entered an 03 into a race that Volvo was known for winning, the Touring Car Championships. Using Volvo's connections, Geely contacted a race team that had been working with the Swedes since 2003, Cyan Racing. You may know them by what they used to be called, Polestar. A little history on Cyan. They won a bunch of touring car championships in the late 90s through the early 2000s with some of the sickest Volvos ever. A Super Touring 850 and an S40 both with five cylinder motors, which are right up there with my personal faves. And starting in 2018, they used the Lincoln Co. 03 as their platform. The Cyan Racing 03 TCR makes 350 hertzpers and helps Cyan win the WTCR Manufacturers Cup in 2019, making it the first Chinese company to win an FIA sanctioned race. And in early 2019, Volvo Performance Division started working on a 528 hertz per road car concept of the Link 03. And I just want to point out that the, the this is an almost 600 horsepower four-cylinder motor. Pretty impressive, pretty impressive. Now, it was this car driven by team driver Fed Bjork, which is a sick name. I didn't even know Fed was a name. Well, old Fed did a lap at the Nürburgring in an insane seven minutes and 20 seconds. It broke both the lap record for fastest front wheel drive car and the four-door production vehicle record. That's freaking nuts. And that's why we did this episode. You guys need to know who these guys are because their future is fast. We learned a lot researching this episode. Uh, I was fortunate enough to make a new friend and talk to him. Uh, shouts to Lulu. My power, baby. Oh, power, baby. My power, baby. I think you're better. If you want to learn more about Chinese car culture, uh, check out this episode of Wheelhouse. I love you.